Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I am really thrilled by this opportunity to be part of the panel today and express my special appreciation and thanks to President Cardozo and to Madame Blaise for inviting me. I will divide my remarks in three parts to start with some preliminary points about the efforts that are being done here yesterday and today to think about how the world will be in 100 years. So, as far as the preliminary points are concerned, predictions about how science may evolve in its various fields of study and research are fascinating. But indeed, for someone like me, who is more involved, let's say, in current affairs, it sounds a little bit like science fiction. So in a way, as I see it, the purpose of our session is to bring context into predictions made by previous speakers, social, cultural, and historical context. Now we need, let's say, turn into the human dimension of predictions and figure out how the world will be in 100 years, assuming that this world is made up of individuals, communities, and wider societies that humans relate to each other, interconnect and develop a wide range of relations based on interests, emotions, beliefs, values, and worldviews, that people live in communities and politics such as states that shape the geopolitical reality and develop power relations. We can indeed make predictions based on scientific data about the evolution of human life, the planet, the society, and the world in general. One can speculate on changes in culture, nature, and technology at large that may take place, that may take place during this period. What one should not forget, let's say, cultural, political, and geopolitical background, as human activity, including making science, is always embedded that shape, is always socially embedded that shape our future. To address these key topics and to try to anticipate the future trends, one has both to look deep into history and to understand the present, as by the way, Josh Friedman in his inspirational book, The Next 100 Years, reminds us. Now, one speaker mentioned yesterday, and I quote, the future, we make it. That's right, but I dare, I really dare to add, we may make it, or the other way around, we can. We can make it. Because there is no deterministic path to the future, but on the contrary, there are several possibilities at stake each time. I think this is called bifurcations in the catast catastrophe theory in physics. So the interesting point in this fundamental freedom or uncertainty that lies at the core of human systems at large. This is what makes politics, in its core meaning, indispensable. Politics involves the making of a common decision for a group of people, that is, a uniform decision applying in the same way to all members of the group. It also involves the use of power by one person, groups, and indeed states, as well as a key point of the distribution of power and it refers as well to governance at large. What I want to underline now is that politics is integral to human life. Representative democracies may be in crisis, and they are. The international community may be confronted with serious challenges, and it does. But I really don't think that we can give up to finding ways of improving democratic governance, be it at local, national, and international level. So my last point of this introduction is aimed at underlining that looking at the world from the future back to the present with 100 years distance, it is not a frivolous exercise, but a way to make us thinking about the decisions we make, we have to make now if we want to offer to the future generations, I mean to our children and grandchildren, a world that we'll, they will be proud of Hopefully, a world that will offer them with better opportunities, or at least, or at least, the same as we have had. 
But this is not to be taken for granted for several reasons. But first and foremost, because for the first time in our world, today's problems of human survival have begun to overshadow more traditional international conflicts. In a way, this is why the Paris Conference taking place now is so dramatically important. So the second part relates to some geopolitical points. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to geopolitical, geopolitics and focus on a number of key issues. As you may remember, by the end of the 20th century, it had become fashionable to argue that history was coming to an end. We all remember, I'm sure, some books on this topic. But let's face it, 15 years later, this assumption fails any reality check. What strikes me in the current international system is that power is diffusing and politics diversifying not one in which all countries are converging towards, let's say, the Western way. On the contrary, there are numerous power centers as well as multiple versions of modernity. These ongoing changes have been very well described by Charles Kupchen in his No One's World, which I will follow here, here and there, as well as, for instance, by Kishore Mahbubani in The Great Convergence Asia West and the Logic of the World of one world. Our very much interactive and interdependent world seems now without a center of gravity, or let's say a major power, a major global power. It seems, on the contrary, to be populated by several power centers and to be a kind of an amalgam of diverse cultures and competing conceptions of domestic and international order. So multipolarity but also diversity of the political landscape, shaped by different versions of modernity, seems to be a main feature of our world today. We need to realize that the West's primacy is waning, that the rest is rising, that the defining features of the West, liberal democracy, industrial capitalism, and secular nationalism, are not being replicated as developing regions modernize. Now, what is at stake and will determine the future is the way this global turn will be managed and will be redesigned. Indeed, capitalism has demonstrated its universal draw, but most rising powers, like China, India, Turkey, Brazil among them, are not tracking the developmental path followed by the West. They have different cultural and socioeconomic foundations, which give rise to their own domestic orders and ideological orientations. So one might assume that emerging powers will want to revise, not to consolidate, the international order built during the West's watch. They have different views about the foundations of political legitimacy, the nature of sovereignty, the rule of international trade, and the relationship between the state and society. Furthermore, even if emerging powers share the West's values, they will spar with the West over matters of status and prestige. One has to recognize that there is a certain sense of resentment by the rising rest against the Western hegemony, and so emerging powers will want more to say in managing global affairs, whatever the issues are at stake. Therefore, we have good reasons to think that there will be more competition between world powers over principles, status, and geopolitical interests as the global turn proceeds. Now, the key point is that the challenge for all will be to forge a new and pluralistic order, one that preserves stability, one that aims at setting up a rules-based international system amid the multiple versions of modernity that will populate the next world. For that, we need to shape a new consensus. And the next question is indeed, what this new consensus would look like. What are the principles around which a new order is likely to take shape? What are the necessary sacrifices to achieve this global compromise and consensus? I have not, of course, a ready-made answer, but one thing seems clear to me. As Einstein noted once, and I quote with full respect, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So trying to think out of the box, as I put it, is the right approach. And maybe some of the questions to be raised are, 
and I just mentioned them. One, how to explore new avenues for equating legitimacy with responsible governance rather than with liberal democracy. How to develop democratic management or governance of political and ideological diversity. How to strike the right balance between global governance and, dev and devolution to regional authorities. How to design a more regulated and state-centric brand of capitalism. Having said that, it is for me crystal clear that global powers and actors have no choice than to, and I quote, undertake globally cooperative responses to the new and increasingly serious challenges to human beings at large, environmental, climatic, socioeconomic, nutritional, or demographic. They have as well to ensure geopolitical stability Otherwise, any effort to achieve the necessary global cooperation will falter. The f quotation comes from the book by Mr. Brzezinski called The Strategic Vision. And the third part relates to some uh, dilemmas I think that have to be addressed, a, a few of them. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just focus on a couple of dilemmas that we are faced with in our societies. Dilemmas that are largely shared by all societies even they present, if they present different forms, intensity, and degrees. Dilemmas whose solution will shape the future. This is not a comprehensive list, of course, but just a few critical examples in my view. So the first dilemma, rule of law, a central concept whose definition remains elusive. Providing a clear-cut definition of the rule of law proves to be more difficult than expected. However, I do believe that everyone might spontaneously agree on two points. Firstly, the rule of law is a good thing because by and large it stands for law governed societies as opposed to all kinds of regimes that flout the rule of law. And we know, unfortunately too well, what are the usual hallmarks of the latter and what are the worst examples of modern day cases. The second point is that the rule of law, and I quote again, refers to a principle of governance in which all persons, institutions, and entities, public and private, including the state itself, are accountable to laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, and independently adjudicated, and which are consistent with international human rights, norms, and standards. This is a quote from the report of the Secretary General of the United Nations 2004. The report was called The Rule of Law and Transitional Justice in Conflict and Post-Conflict Societies. Now my questions are, how can the achievements of the rule of law be preserved and further developed at a time when there are new emerging modes of governance in which individuals engage, when many fields of activities are dominated by a kind of a hybrid public-private actors and partnerships of all kinds, acting at transnational and international levels rather than within national borders. How high levels of entrenched inequalities in our societies are definitely undermining access to justice and to the rule of law. Regarding this point on inequality, let me underline that it remains one of the greatest challenging issues of our times. Inequality towards human rights enjoyment and social justice in every sphere of public life it pervades. Justice services, mechanisms and institutions are no exception. The poorest and most marginalized segments of society, being women or girls, ethnic minorities, indigenous peoples, undocumented migrants or those living in rural areas, continue to be excluded from accessing justice on an equal footing with the most privileged segments of the population. This is the case in every country across the globe, even if the discriminatory patterns manifest themselves differently across regions and within countries. This is again a quotation from a, a recent United Nations report, but I couldn't agree more with it as, it, as I do believe that inequality may well become one of the most harsh threats against the ability for citizens to enforce their rights, which in any case is required by the rule of law properly and effectively. 
The second dilemma is terrorism and security. Ladies and gentlemen, the item now is on terrorism and security. In 2002, the late and well-known Sergio Vieira de Mello, United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights and Brazilian, uh, not a Brazilian like our good friend here, Enrique Cardoso, he said, and I quote, the best, the only strategy to isolate and defeat terrorism is by respecting human rights, fostering social justice, enhancing democracy, and upholding the primacy of the rule of law." End of quote. Yet this kind of vision has remained by and large wishful thinking, in particular during the first years of this century, marked by the war on terror, when confronting the terrorist threat was mainly guided by security imperatives in order to protect citizens against unwarranted violence. Counter-terrorism strategies have then preconized and endorsed practices and activities such as terrorist classification, detentions without charge or trial, coercive interrogation, and other counter-terrorist measures, not to even mention the practice of torture, that sometimes blur the line between human rights protections and human rights violations. Today, we are again facing extremely challenging and hard times as terrorist violence is testing, really testing, the rule of law to the utmost. For states suffering from terrorist action, the temptation to fight fire with fire and to cross the boundary that separates the lawful from the unlawful exists. For unlawful terror organizations such as ISIS, there seems to be no safeguards, no boundaries, no principles, no standards, no fundamental values, no adherence to the rule of law, no international obligations whatsoever. So this poses a new, huge challenge to the international community, but also, of course, to all of us, members of the global community of citizens that we cannot avoid to confront. If something has to be learned from past history, mainly from the dark period of Nazism, it is for sure the urgent need to reflect deeper on how to employ the full, to the full our arsenal of legal weapons to repress and prevent the hideous terrorist activities that every day kill and injure innocent people, undermine the social fabric of societies, destroy countries and threaten security and peace peoples around the world. I really wonder whether we are confronting these challenges in an appropriate way, combining a long-term strategic vision and sense of urgency, and building upon lessons learned from failures and successes in dealing with and ending conflicts with armed groups over the past years. But this topic, of course, will make another conference. The third dilemma relates to the information and communication technologies, and they are what I call the challenges of digital age. In my view, this is another crucial new topic, as Professor Manuel Castells has abundantly showed in his books. I will not enter into many details. We all know what digital age stands for, the radical change produced in our lives, the wide array of opportunities that it has opened up, notably for businesses, growth, and sharing information. But let me also mention that it brought a host of new problems for society and public powers that have to find answers to them. So my point here is focused on challenges, problems, and risks arising from the massive use of information and communication technologies that has completely changed the way we live, the way we work, and how we interact. Striking the right balance between protection of the privacy of individuals and free movement of personal data, cybercrime and mass surveillance are some of the challenges that have to be confronted. Some of the core questions around this topic are, how will big data, such as your history, your financial status, your medical reports, be collected, be used, be stored? How can do the data, that data mining, we'll keep it safe. How will we, how will we, how will we handle 
global data breaches affecting multiple jurisdictions, for example. On the other hand, cybercrime at large, which is increasingly crossing national boundaries, has become a serious threat that may pose a real challenge to all states, including the most powerful and the most well-organized. At least this means two things. On the one hand, all states and their peoples have a common interest, and this is to be better protected. On the other hand, in this field, the exata question of international jurisdiction seems to be at stake as an indispensable way to address the new challenges to rule of law in our global village. Another important topical issue is mass, mass surveillance. The recent disclosure of controversial mass surveillance programs by intelligence and national security agencies has sparked an international debate on the right of citizens to be protected from illegitimate and warrantless collection and analysis of their data and metadata. There is a wide range of risks to data breaches for users of publicly available internet services, such as web browsing, email, social networks, cloud computing, or voice communications via personal computers or mobile devices. Some of the questions to be asked in this respect are the following. What are the possible impacts for the citizens and the information society which we are living in? Where to draw a line between what is acceptable for the sake of national security and what is unacceptable on the grounds of protection of freedoms and democracy? The fourth dilemma is upholding human rights, which I consider, an, of course, an unfinished task. Ladies and gentlemen, drawing to a close, my last reflections go to the need to uphold human rights as the core component of the rule of law. Indeed, there are some historical controversies on the relationship between human rights and the rule of law. But on this point, I am shamelessly human rights-centric, fully embracing the protection of human rights within its scope. And I quote, a state which is savagely represses or persecutes sections of its people cannot, in my view, be regarded as observing the rule of law, even if the transport of the persecuted minority to the concentration camp or to the compulsory exposure of female children on the mountainside is a subject of detailed laws duly enacted and scrupulously observed. These are not my words, as I said, but a quotation from Lord Tom Bingham's celebrated book, The Rule of Law. But I fully endorse them. They stand for what I truly believe and what is my core contention, i.e., that the rule of law only makes sense if the law affords adequate protection of fundamental rights regarded as the basic entitlements of a human being. Indeed, this is not to be taken for granted. This is why we cannot surrender in our uphill battle to address violations and abuses of human rights. Uphold, ladies and gentlemen, uphold the principles of human dignity by the rule of law and by realizing human rights is an endless task, but we should simply not give it up. Firstly, because regressions are always possible and humanity has never progressed forward in a straight line. Secondly, because never before in human history have so many people been lifted out of absolute poverty and human condition improved in so many aspects. So let us simply not allow that steps are taken backward. Let's keep history making steps forward over the next 100 years. Thank you for your attention.